this video we're going to learn the definition and two results about limit point compactness. We say that a topological space X is limit point compact if every infinite subset of X has a limit point. Remember that limit points, if the subset is called A, then the limit points, we call them A prime, and we knew that the closure of a set was equal to A union is limit point. So let's see the relation between limit point compactness and compactness. This theorem tells us that if we have a compact space, then it is also a limit point compact set. To prove this theorem, we will have to take a set A of x infinite and prove that A has a limit point. But this assertion is equivalent to proving that if A has no limit points, then A has to be finite. And this is what we are going to prove. So let's take A a subset of x that has no limit points. So given that the closure of A is equal to A union its limit points, because this set is empty, then we know that the closure is equal to A, and this tells us that A is closed. But also, because it has no limit points, then points within our set also cannot get accumulated, so our points are going to be distant from each other meaning that for every element in this set there will exist a neighborhood, let's call it UA a neighborhood of A, so it's an element in the topology that contains the element A such that UA intersection A only equals to the point A so in this drawing we would always be able to find these sets like this. But now remember that X is compact and the collection consisting of X minus A and all these sets UA for each A in A is a covering of X and then because X is compact there will exist a finite covering from this one. So, well, obviously we will have the x minus a and we will have a finite amount of these sets. Let's call them u sub a i with i from 1 up to n. But then if this set is a covering of x, then this collection is a covering of a. And so a must be equal to the union from i equals 1 up to n of this u sub a sub i. But these sets, we said that their intersection with a was just the element alone. So this is the union of all these single elements. And so a is finite. So what we did was we supposed that A had no limit points, and with that assumption, we got that A is finite. With this, we have that X is limit point compact. Okay, so compact implies limit point compact, but is the reciprocal valid? We will see that it's not with an example. For this, we will take Y to be a set consisting of only two elements, A and B, with the trivial topology. And now we will consider X in the product space of the natural numbers times Y. So all the elements in X are of the form M times A or N times B for N a natural number. Well, it's very easy to notice that this set X is not compact because if I take any covering of X then I will not be able to find a finite covering because I will have to still cover all the natural numbers so X is not compact. But is A limit point compact? 
Well, yes, and it's actually very trivial to see this, because if we take an element in the space of the form n times a, one neighborhood of this element is going to be, well, a neighborhood of n, because we're in the product topology, times a neighborhood of a. A neighborhood of n is this one. And the neighborhood of a, it can only be the whole set. And if we take another element in the space with the same n, but the other element b, then this is a limit point in the space. Because if we do the intersection, of the neighborhood minus this set n times b, and intersect this with our space, this is giving us non-empty. And so n times b is a limit point. So this proves that x is limit point compact. But we already saw that it's not compact. So now limit point compactness does not imply compactness. Let's finish this video with a last theorem that will give us a characterization of compactness in metric spaces. This theorem tells us that whenever we are in a metrizable space, that is, we have x a topological space, and that topology can be induced by a metric. In those spaces, compactness, limit point compactness, and sequentially compactness are all equivalent. Sequentially compactness it's a term that should be familiar to you from another subject, but let's explain it here. We are in a topological space X. The space will be sequentially compact if any time we take a sequence in the space, there exists a subsequence that is compressioned. So if for every sequence we grab in a space, there exists a conversion subsequence then we say that our space is sequentially compact. Well, in metric spaces or in metrizable spaces, that definition is the same as saying that the space is compact or limit point compact. To prove this theorem, we will prove that 1 implies 2, that 2 implies 3, and that 3 implies 1. Now, this very first one, 1 implies 2, we already have it because we already proved that compact implied limit point compact. Well, now let's see that 2 implies 3. We know that our space is limit point compact, and we have to prove that it's sequentially compact. So we have to take any sequence in our space and prove that it contains a conversion subsequence. So let's take xn sequence. And now what we will do is we have to use the limit point compactness. So we know that any infinite set in our space has a limit point. So why don't we take A to be the set of all the elements in the sequence. The difference between these two notations is that if we have a repeated element in the sequence, then A will only have one time that element. So if the sequence is constant, for example, then A will only consist of one element. So we have two options for this set A. It can be finite or infinite. Well, if A is finite, that is because from one point onwards, the sequence is being repeated. The sequence is turning out to be constant. So there will exist a natural number n such that xn is equal to some element x in the space for every n that's greater than n. And we can take the subsequence to be simply repeating this element over and over again infinitely many times. This obviously is a subsequence of the original one and it trivially converges to x. So we found what we wanted. But what happens if A is infinite? Well, now it's when it's useful to remember that X was limit point compact. Because this implies that A has a limit point. 
let's call it x and it will be an element in x so we have to now build the subsequence from this original sequence that we took in our space and what we will do is take x1 an element in the ball with centering this limit point x and radius 1 there will be probably infinitely many points in this ball so we just have to choose one we are obviously using the axiom of choice here but this is something that we have already used many times in the reproduction list and we will continue like this choosing x and i an element in the ball with centering this limit point x and radius 1 over i remember that we are in a metrizable space so we have a metric and thus we have the balls. If we continue like this indefinitely, we will end up with a subsequence x and i, which trivially is converging to x. And so we have what we wanted. We found in both cases a subsequence of this original sequence that converges. With this, we can say that our space is sequentially compact. Now let's prove that 3 implies 1. For this, what we will prove is that for every epsilon greater than zero, there will exist a finite covering of x with poles of radius epsilon. This will be enough to prove that our space is compact, because if then we take any cover of the space, there will exist some epsilon such that we can take balls of center in some elements in that covering and with radius epsilon that also cover our space. So with this we will be able to find a finite covering of those balls and thus a finite covering of the original covering we took in the space. Let's prove this by contradiction. So suppose that there exists some epsilon such that x cannot be covered by finite balls of radius epsilon. Now let's take some element x1 in x. We are going to build the sequence. Because x cannot be covered by finitely many balls, then the ball with center in x1 and radius epsilon does not cover x. That means that there exists some element x2 that is not in this ball. So we will choose some element here. And then we can again choose x3 that is not an element of the ball with center in x1 and radius epsilon or the ball with center in x2 and radius epsilon. If we cannot find such x3 then that means that these two balls are covering a whole space but we are supposing that that doesn't happen. So we can always find some x sub n that is not in the union of all these poles. This implies that the distance between xn and xi is always greater than epsilon. And this will happen for i equal to 1 up to n minus 1, because xn is not part of any of these poles. But then we were able to construct a sequence that will not have any conversion subsequence. But this is a contradiction because our space was sequentially compact and that means that we will have this and thus our space is compact. So that proves this theorem.